Thank you very much. That's a great honor to be here with you. May I be here in front of you? Uh, it's really, I've charged my batteries because, you know, when you talk to so many people of brave heart, of generous soul, you definitely come back with a lot of good inspirations and thoughts. What I'm going to talk about is not about so much about standard economics. I'll be talking about good and bad. And I would be probably talking more about the situation that would also concern not only Belarus, because we are all living in the country which is surrounded by uh, prevailing ideological and mainstream forces. So the situation would be referring to good and evil in the whole world, and I would be trying to uh, give you some thoughts how we can deal with these things so the barometer is not in the evil territory, but on the good part of that. Unfortunately, now it's evil. And let me start with this particular thing. Uh, capitalism is a road to nowhere. That's the message that propaganda is selling us. It's not only the propaganda in Belarus or Russia or uh, Europe. That's the propaganda which is getting harder and harder in the United States. And now that's something that is also not about propaganda, that's about the basic thing. Thy shall not lie. Lying is bad, right? So this is lie because that's part of the truth. The, the second part of the truth is the following. That's what propaganda people don't tell us, that the road is very nice, well that's the end of it, and e after that road you see the abrupt end or the turn to socialism. That's what Castro regime wanted us to think, Putin, Lukashenko, many bad guys. Many people in America also, in Spain, in Italy, they want us to believe that this is the end for social for capitalism. We are that that part is not there because they don't want all of us ordinary people to go along the path of prosperity. They want prosperity only for themselves, and that is very bad. So the crisis that we are all in is not the crisis of uh, money. That's the result of the opinion poll conducted by World Economic Forum, fourteen thousand people worldwide. And they acknowledged 67.7% that's a moral crisis in the first place. So people have lost the kind of uh, beacons, orientations, what is good or what is bad. They have their tools kind of in, in, in not order. And that's one of the most fundamental things today. Because they also are part of the problem. Look, the question is, do you think people apply the same values in their work or their professional life? More than 61% said no. So we lie. And lying became a part of our standard behavior. 61% of the population, that's a lot. So we find virtue a rare creature in the modern world. And that is something that we should take into mind when you talk to people, because when you appeal to people saying, well, capitalism is about money, is about transnational corporations, is about technology, that's one thing. The bottom line is always, we lie or we don't lie. We, uh, we take care of the elderly or the children or not. And I would, I'm going to prove that the system that is contrary to capitalism, socialism, or I call it interventionism, because you guys in Cuba have a totalitarian Stalinist regime that we had before 1989. And I lived under this regime, my parents lived there, and I know that firsthand, I felt that on my skin. So I can compare the two systems and can, can give you something of an uh, for the uh, probably side, what it could go, uh, go to. So the moral creed of capitalism, still un undiscovered, is in this very simple sentence of this very uh, famous author in some parts of, uh, of the world. She is definitely much uh, more better known in America than in Europe. But she is the philosopher of capitalism. Every time I ask my uh, colleagues, my friends in, back in Europe. So Marx and Lenin are ideologues of t t socialism. Who is the person to 
write about ideas and ideals of capitalism. They couldn't tell me. And I think that Ayn Rand is the one. So I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another person, nor ask another person to live for mine. That the ultimate creed of a of a somebody who believes in capitalism. It says that I'm not going to exploit others. I'm not going to steal from others. I'm not going to neglect the poor because they are poor. I'm not going to live at the expense of others, but I, that's not my, uh, I'm not a sacrificial animal. I'm not the one who would just, you are told by the government to be uh, a, the sponsor of the regime and you give all your money alive to that. That is not the case, and that very simple phrase, creed, is still undiscovered uh, in most part of the world, and that's part of the problem. So how people and elites in totalitarian countries perceive capitalism? That's the result of many, many opinion polls. They think that effective money-making machine, well, which is, it is. There's not a better system to make money than capitalism. Money makes the world go round. That's money can buy you everything. That the message you can get from movies, from books, from, from talking to people, from mass media. That's unfortunately something that we should uh, combat, challenge. Egoistic do eat dog competition, though as allegedly in, under capitalism there are no rules, but they, if uh, uh, rich Cuban Americans came to Cuba to help the country, they will buy it out and they will just exploit poor Cubans who are in Cuba. That's the same stuff we were taught, uh, we were told in the Soviet Union. When uh, greedy Americans or Europeans came to Belarus or Russia, they will uh, use us all, almost as slaves in this country, in our own countries. That is why we must build some fences, some barriers for them to come as these are our countries. That's this, the kind of the ideological dogmas that, uh, that uh, opponents and enemies of capitalism pursue. Big rich guys have more power than little poor ones. That's another dogma. Huge gap between the rich and the poor. And you have, for example, like American Jeffrey Sachs, who is one of the uh, main socialist economists who is in charge of the fight with poverty and the United Nations. And uh, that's not that we only fight our own socialists inside countries. There are very many of them who are prominent, who are Nobel Prize winners, who are in fact protagonists of socialism and they're very anti-capitalist. That's absolutely true. Who cares about soul and morality attitude? You never hear uh, them uh, allegedly capitalist people talking about these things. They ignore uh, charity work, they ignore voluntary work, they ignore many things that wonderful thing that people who became rich, became prosperous, successful under capitalism performed. Severe deficit of solidarity, compassion, uh, this is something that, like, you know, uh, famous pop singer Madonna described in her song, I'm a material girl in a material world. That's how our enemies describe capitalism. And if they use, like in Belarus or Russia, uh, monopoly over mass media, you have that banged into your heads, you have main uh, educational institutions teaching that, it's really difficult to get with an alternative message. So the dangerous idea fix is still there, and I think that will be a, a valid for Cuba as well. That's what uh, people in Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, that part of the world uh, wanted to combine. The combination of true love and friendship, these are allegedly something that socialism is famous for and good at, right? Uh, these are things that capitalism is good at. If somehow we merge these things, we've got the best system in the world. And that is, look at that, These are, this is all good. Good free education, good free health care, no big gap between rich and the poor, no unemployment. In Belarus, unemployment is 0.6%. So every time uh, some ideologues from Europe came, they wonder, how come you made it? In Spain, that's 25%. In uh, uh, youth unemployment in Europe is over that number, like 30-35%. So they believe that this is something that we achieved and there is a good combination and for that we need a strong hand. <coughs> is that true and is it possible? Of course not. 
But again, as I told you, there are ideologues who really want to see things like they are. If you talk about socialism, they go social life, solidarity, cohesion, well-being, things that are good, while in, if you Google the word capitalism in many languages, you have like 10 pages of very dirty things. And that's the result of severe propaganda, not only from like socialist countries or Cuban government or Russian or Belarusian government. That's primarily the result of anti-capitalist propaganda from the West. Uh, Ayn Rand wrote uh, very many outstanding things, but she uh, gave a very uh, good uh, description of, uh, of compromise. And if we study that carefully, we understand why uh, people compromise so much and these compromises led to evil choices, to unethical behavior. So first, in any conflict between two men who hold the same basic principles, it is the more consistent one that wins. So essentially, if we are together, we want to build a prosperous Cuba, and I argue, for example, I give you my idea of a tax system for future Cuba, Cuba that consists only of three taxes, Right? It's very simple. Anybody can pay taxes based on that, and the, uh, the, the uh, probability of making a mistake is nothing. It's zero, right? Or you can have a different idea about that. So we can sit down and argue what is the best. But if you have radically different approaches, if you want to uh, get 50% of the money a Cuban earns and give it to politicians, then we cannot agree on that. It's like Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. The government allegedly reformed itself, but still it steals 50-55% of the money from the people and gives it in the hands of government officials. In any collaboration between two men and who hold different basic principles, it is the more evil and irrational the who wins. That's very important because we always uh, face this moral dilemma. Should we cooperate and what in what fear with the authorities? Can we cheat them to uh, get them involved in some projects so that they get weaker? And in the end of the day, we prevail, we win. And if, again, we collaborate them on uh, very shaky grounds, on irrational issues, then they poison us. That's also a very important thing because many uh, reformers say, okay, we give uh, in to the government in this area, in taxes, we give on the government regulation, we will uh, continue protectionism, but in the end of the day, we are still there. We can whisper in the ear of our dictator or ruler, president, good things, and we can save us. Many, many reformers in post-Soviet countries proved wrong because they were used, they were abused, and the words like capitalism, liberal, liberalism, never mentioned, uh, were just distorted and de destroyed their reputation. And finally, when opposite basic principles are clearly openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. So the good. So that's why it's so important to vocalize, to verbalize things that you want to produce for your country as a positive alternative. Many reformers, they uh, began to think about reforms when the power was in their hands. Like in the Soviet Union, nobody planned the dissolution or breakup of the Soviet Union. George Bush Sr. was against the dissolution of the Soviet Union. He begged Yeltsin and Putin to keep the country because he was afraid because the Soviet Union had nuclear power. A lot of nuclear missiles and that chaos could end up in very, very dramatic things. So, uh, but in, that is very important and clear. We have to clearly define our position and pursue it as uh, adamantly as possible. Uh, so, from my experience in Belarus and uh, other transitional economies that I've been closely following, there is no moral justification for high inflation. Uh, inflation, as according to Cuban statistics, in Cuba was much lower than in Belarus or, or in Russia. But inflation ultimately is the way to steal from poor pensioners, from uh, families with many kids, from people who do not have economic education, and give it in the hands of those 
who take loans from the government, who use the money f uh, and abuse it. So inflation, my parents, uh, in 1987, 8, uh, they had savings for two car, for two apartments, for myself and my brother. In 1992, there were just two pieces of sausage. That's it. And that is ultimate robbery of the poor, of the people. So if you want to really to send a message to people, keep money sound and safe. And the only possible theoretical option that's argued here is to have gold standard to get money back to where it was. We don't want Federal Reserve or European Central Bank or whatever authority to inflate money. It's like 1913, a dollar of 1913 was, uh, uh, and dollar today, are two different currencies. Like three cents only is the dollar worth of the dollar 1913. And that's in America. Because Americans don't understand because, you know, it's like two, three percent inflation, that's too little. But in, in our country, in Cuba, for example, if uh, Raul or whoever, whoever in the government starts printing money, you get inflation, and inflation is the, the best, the most effective way to steal from the poor, yeah. to rob them. Likewise, price fixing. We had the situation like uh, 2011 in Belarus with inflation over 100%. We have hyperinflation. And the government said, we want to save, uh, to take care of the poor families. That's why we must fix prices for milk and meat products. In the end of the day, what it happened that there were no meat dairy products in shops. Because who cared, you know, if the price is so uh, low, so there was a huge incentive to export these products to Russia and make extra money or abroad. And that is an absolute uh, ultimate economic law that not a single authority can, can, can challenge. Keeping uh, nationalization, that happens also in General Motors, you know what it is in America, but in Belarus not a single state company or company that was nationalized worked and produced more jobs. So you have, it's moral to create jobs, it's good to get new jobs for the country, but unfortunately people that were deprived of this right, private entrepreneurs, uh, cannot do that, and government officials did not deliver. Uh, keeping big business afloat at the expense of taxpayers is very popular, because that's the way big guys uh, exploit the poor. Uh, and the concept, too important, too big to fail, was not invented in Russia or Belarus. It was invented by IMF and big guys in Washington and uh, Europe. That's the point, and the concept itself is absolutely in conflict with capitalism that made America and Europe rich. Living at the expense of future generations, we're talking about pensions and health care and liabilities. So my uh, parents, if I, did, I don't help them, didn't help them, they would be really like spending 90% of the pension on food. And it wasn't enough because of the price fixing. F uh, prices in an isolated protectionist economy is like two, three times higher than the neighboring countries. So what people do, they go to neighboring countries, buy meat, fish, vegetables, fruit, and by that they, they save a lot of money. So that's the outcome of manipulation of prices and protectionism. So you see like free education, health care, banning certain kinds of economic activities. These are all immoral activities because in the end of the day, ordinary people suffer. They cannot make their way from rocks to riches in one generation. They cannot protect their savings. They must always address the government to help them. And the bureaucrats, uh, all the, they love to get this kind of situation, like, uh, for example, in Belarus today, utility services. The government sent the message, uh, you must be grateful to us because you pay just a fraction of the price of, you, of energy, of water supply, of sewage uh, system, and if uh, there is market uh, around you capitalism, then you will be paying like three, five times more. But if I forget to mention that nobody made an audit of the price because they include huge salaries for themselves in the price. And just imagine a poor country, which is Belarus is, uh, 
government officials and people who work in the utility business, they just drive cars that are worth fifty, seventy thousand dollars. And this is only the prices. So that's kind of you know distortion of morality that these guys have, and of course they create these you know fears that are around there that capitalism allegedly creates. So beneficiaries and ba of bans, restrictions, and government programs are politicians, bureaucrats, political entrepreneurs. These are the, the people who work hand in hand with government officials, lawbreakers, and mafia. So if you want to have the culture of law-abiding citizens, the culture where people are safe to do business, to walk in the streets, never experiment with socialism, with other kind of interventionism. So, and that is why all these people, do you think they are poor? Have you ever seen a, an experienced poor politician? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So the morality is, even under socialist ideology, if you really want to help the poor to express solidarity, Help them. So I, I calculated that in, in the work, work in the Belarusian budget. So if uh, you give like two hundred dollars to each person who is qualified to be poor, you save about eight billion dollars from the budget. So if that's the approach. Who the poor person is? These are criteria. You can name them because in Cuba and Belarus we almost have the same population. So people, if you have decentralized power. People in the local level can know, name all of them and see, this is, okay, if you are poor, this is for your, for example, your disabled person. So that will be, a, uh, we don't, uh, we like people who stand for capitalism, we don't be, think that there will be like overnight uh, transition to capitalism, the, there will be definitely a transitional period. And this transitional period, we should help the people uh, who have been under regime for a long time, because their mindset is different. And it's extremely difficult to change a mind of a person if the elite or uh, people who live abroad are uh, good enough or are mature enough to carry out reforms. So uh, clash of cultures is something that is there. Cuba is very similar from what I heard and what I read about Cuba and opinion polls conducted in Cuba than Belarus and the Soviet Union because ultimately we've got the same ideological fathers. Unfortunately, Marx is still deep in our minds and hearts because we believe that making money is bad, is evil, without acknowledging what the root of making of money is. So interventionist culture is freeloading, Slapdash work and moonshining, sycophancy, hypocrisy, mysticism, and boorishness. People are different. They believe this is what makes them, uh, well, happier, more prosperous in life. While in capitalism, this is the culture that cannot be uh, cop, cut and pasted. Even if you have all ministers from America, as like we had all ministers from Germany, it will never happen. The system that you guys have here in, in, uh, in America, or we had, uh, Germans have, or Swedish have, will never start operating and getting the same results. Because people are different. And that is one of the biggest challenges of transition that few people in IMF, in World Bank, in UN recognized. That you, in order to have a good start, you must have basic functions of the government in the first place. Don't intervene in the economy and hundreds of thousands of other functions that you have no idea how to regulate. But that was the typical mistake of transitional economies. Government was all price fixing, money regulation, investment policies, for example, you, all of, many of you here are in business. So the government says, we know what business opportunities will be in five, ten years. That's a very arrogant way of dealing with money and the future. They don't know, they have no idea what to do. But they claim that and they get money from the taxpayers to support these projects. But, and that we are talk, talking now about the culture of, uh, of interventionism in the world uh, scale. So that is one of the uh, opinion polls conducted in November 2011. Success in life is ensured by forces beyond your control. So, uh, or you control your success story. 
So America is still one of very, very few countries in the world where less than half of the population believe that success is not about your own hard work. Success is about uh, about your hard, hard work, right? So not about other people, forces outside your control. Like Great Britain is moving full speed in ideology to socialism. Lithuania, uh, it's a country also of uh, former Soviet Union, 41. But Spain, look at that, 50. Russia, 54. Ukraine, 60. France, 57. Germany, 72. So people believe that if you are successful, that's not because you work hard, you studied well, you have good connections, you have good social capital, you are a good person, moral person. That's because you have good connections, that's because you have uh, uh, somebody, a relative somewhere at the top, that's why you can steal and you're not punished. And that's, again, that's not a problem of legal country like Belarus is, or legal country as Cuba. We are not... Uh, Pioneers, we are not the uh, people who di dictate mode or vogue in this direction, fashion. We are just, you know, second-handers in the ideology. That is why, but this is the places where bad ideas are formed. Clash of theories and scholars is in place. And look at these uh, four pictures. I can get more. And these pictures. These are, what do you think uh, students study at universities. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when everybody realized that Soviet Union socialism didn't work, still we have more Marxists today than we had in the beginning of the 90s. Because Marxism turned into analytical Marxism, post-Soviet Marxism. They believed that Marxism did not deliver because people screwed up, sorry. And that is still there. That's, I remember I, my, one of my students went to Scotland, and he came back like in three years. He said, I'm proud to say that I'm a Marxist. I said, you, what? Excuse me? You, just, you see a Marxist country in Belarus, like Belarus or Russia, and you still believe that that's a good theory? You guys don't understand uh, how to build this country. That's what many people who want to justify their presence in power and their getting uh, use of the resources say. Ayn Rand, few people know that, and unfortunately she's vilified, she's mystified, uh, but few people read that because her novels are very thick. <coughs> who read Anna Karenina? So yeah, that's right. It's a very big, or who uh, read War and Peace? Big thing. Ayn Rand is that thick. And that's, that prevents many people from thinking. Oh gosh, that's too, too, why should I bother? But we definitely, Ludwig von Mises, his, as I said, if the world learned Mises instead of Marx, uh, the world would have spared, would not have had two world wars. So the choice of bad ideology and theory cost mankind like 100 or 150 million lives. That's how powerful ideology is. Uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, Milton Friedman, these are champions of freedom, though they're different. We can say how different they are in monetary theory, in this or that, but in the end of the day, they definitely are champions of capitalism. Why? Uh, John Maynard Keynes. He is one of the least appreciated, not uh, acknowledged, evil guys. He is the guy who believes that the government can step in and start getting a country out of a crisis. Almost all modern economic policy is Keynesianism. Obama is a Keynesian. Left wing. Uh, I couldn't tell, uh, I couldn't say not a Keynesian person in Europe among uh, prime ministers and, and presidents. Our president is uh, Marxist, of course. He'd love to have uh, like a Stalinist grip, like in Cuba, but uh, unfortunately we live in, in Europe and having Iron Curtain costs a lot. And Belarus doesn't have so so many so much resources. That's the only reason why we didn't we don't have a Cuba type of regime in our country. But other than that, we definitely would have had. So uh, Stiglitz and the uh, Jeffrey Sachs. 
The problem with Stiglitz is that he's got Nobel Prize. <laughs> so people believe that things that he promotes are okay, are good. So who am I? I'm just a little guy from unknown Belarus. Who listens? Just imagine somebody uh, well, in a year or sooner uh, something when one goes wrong with Castro, the other Castro, and Cuba is free. Who would be the <coughs> people to advise new Cuban government what economy to build? Jeffrey Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs and George Stiglitz. <laughs> Paul Krugman to add to that, because they've got Nobel Prize winners. They know how to do that. They knew how to do that in Bolivia, in Poland, though they screwed up, but they still are respected. And that's a problem of who should be like a consultant in this. If you choose a bad consultant for business, your business can go broke. But if you choose a bad consultant for the country, you can have like a U-turn like Russia did. In, 19, in the beginning of the 90s, Russia was a democracy, more or less with a lot of expectations. But then FSB or KGB right now in Russia came back with vengeance. And now, it's the same thing, but more sophisticated. It has some valves or where pressure can get out of the system. They are ruthless, and it's much more difficult to fight with Putin again, because he believes that, well, he's got the same kind of American businesses, for example. They say that Russia has one of the best business climates in, in, in the world. You've got ExxonMobil people, you've got, uh, you name it, Fortune 500 corporations saying, well, we, 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 that's fine to work in Russia because if you go there, you have same money monopoly. You have a deal with a bureaucrat, you, get, you are ready to give him a kickback, and that's it. Unfortunately, that's the reality. So, lots of moral grounds and people are disoriented and give you, that's reality. You look at this uh, paradox. 68% of people in the European Union believe that the government intervenes into their lives too much. That would be a very powerful message, right? So if the government intervenes too much, you expect them to want more freedom, more capitalism, more entrepreneurship. And if you look at who is elected, people elect people who promise more jobs at the government expense, more regulation, less free trade. So people definitely, and whom they trust, look at that, this is the trust of the government. That is 38%, uh, that was in 2012, it's another uh, worldwide uh, uh, barometer. Businesses are trusted more, media are trusted more, and NGOs, government, uh, non-government organizations, civil society. So that gives us uh, some light on what we should do to get over this crisis, to get out of this crisis. Uh, something that really shocked me, this is the result of the latest opinion poll published in January 2013. Americans see government as a threat to their personal liberties. 53% of Americans believe that the federal government threatens personal rights and freedoms. 53%. And look at the uh, change. In uh, 1995, there were only 36 percent. So, so there must be something wrong when the government, the, the ordinary people, are becoming more and more afraid of its own government. And we're not talking about Russia. We're not talking about Belarus. We're not talking about Kazakhstan. We're talking about the heart of so-called capitalism. I say so-called because America is no longer a capitalist country. What is more important than democracy is a strong leader. Countries that allegedly were successful in transition. Look at that. In Lithuania in 1991, 79% believe that, that democracy is better. After 20 years, only 52%. Ukraine is even worse. Tragedy. And Ukraine, we have democracy, but we have chaos of competing mafia clans, uh, gangsters that took uh, over the control of the most profitable parts of the economy. Russia, 51%, that was barely the middle, uh, the, the half, now it's 32%. They're ready for another dictator. Take us and rule us, it's like Andy said. People have no idea what to do with freedom. And that's because nobody worked with the culture. 
there is no uh, network institution that can be very consistent and talk them not about money, but about morality, about ethics, about the good, not the bad. And the key driver of comeback of morality, and that's our like chance for all of us, for everybody who really cares, is this. That's also the result of the opinion poll. Who is the most influential person? Whom do you trust? And these are the like academic experts, academical experts, with 68%. Then you have technical experts, 66%. And this is a new phenomenon. That definitely is the government, right? Government official. They're not trusted and their the popularity drops tremendously. But this is a person like yourself, plus 22 points f during one year, 65% is trusted. So one of, each one of us, using modern uh, means of communication, using internet, uh, Facebook, all these contacts, getting involved in civic activities, supporting uh, whatever Olga suggests or all of us do will definitely make more to freedom contribution to morality than just if you are government officials. Because people disagree with them, they are fed up with them. And this phenomenon of a person next to you, a person like you, is extremely important. So now, like YouTube, for example, launches, uh, I guess, video like 60, 65 channels. So I think that within like five years, we will not have monopoly of the, of the television. So television will be as a means of indoctrination uh, getting weaker and weaker. Not only in, uh, in rich countries, as you have it, but in, our, in uh, Belarus, in Russia, and evidently sometime in the future in Cuba. But Cuba, that is the message for new Cuba. So Cubans who care, Cubans who have positive agenda, Cubans who can deliver messages can definitely make a huge difference. If you rely on just uh, foreigners to give you uh, on a plate a uh, good system, it won't work. Because there are, uh, interestingly, when uh, people ask Alan Greenspan, who that time was in the, uh, at the top of uh, American government in 1989, uh, whether they had any advice and any recommendations for the Soviet Union that collapsed because uh, Yeltsin that time sent people to America to, for, for assistance, for help. And Greenspan in his book wrote that we just looked at each other and what did they do? They set up a working group to monitor changes in Russia. Carol, yeah. Sorry, I, I hate to interrupt you. Wrap it up in a couple yeah, of Yeah, that's right. That's done uh, for raving up. One, 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 one quick question. Uh, are you concerned by that phenomenal drop in CEO influence? That's because uh, transnational corporations are too much uh, in this sense of guilt. Transnational corporations became, in many, many senses, uh, partners of big business, of big government. And that is the result of that, unfortunately. Not small business, but I'm talking about big, big guys that, that screw up, transnational corporations. So, moral response to fears and prejudices about that. Fear of, these are the old fears that people face when they are to face change. Losing a job, poverty, high prices. When you talk, when I campaign in my country, because I also I use my presidential campaign just to deliver simple messages about morality of free market economy. And if you don't need to use the word capitalism, use a different word. Because that's, it, it's not about like I want to dedicate like 80% of my time to explaining what capitalism really is. You have to talk about issues. And these are the issues you two should talk about using a lot of experience from other countries. So education, advocacy of true capitalism, training knowledge multiplies, that what we should get involved in. Capitalism is not about money. It is all about the love of your best self. Thank you very much. Thank you.